195 BC, the seventh year of the Han Dynasty, a time of danger and risk. But with each passing day, the health of Liu Bang, the founding emperor of Han, worsened. Who would succeed him to the throne when the inevitable came to pass? I 正赶上秦朝禁绝百家之学的时候，总认为读书没什么用。但自从登基以来，才领悟到读书的重要性，现在想起从前的种种作为，真是懊悔。A man's words are kind when his death is close. In this imperial edict, he wrote to his son, Liu Ying. Liu Bang carried out a thorough self-reflection. Liu Bang was born into a peasant family in Peixian County. There was little education in his family, so he never acquired a fondness for studying. According to records of the Grand Historian, Liu Bang's father regarded him as a rogue, unable to manage the properties of his family, and thought he was no match for his elder brother, Liu Zhong. As a young man, Liu Bang often hung out with butchers, pawns, vendors, and petty officials, always idling and belittling scholars with curses. He mocked and taunted scholars. To him, they were just poor nerds. In 209 BC, as the tyranny of the Qin Empire intensified, the suffering of the common people increased. At the time, Chen Sheng and Wu Guang raised a rebellion in Da Zuxiang, lighting the torch for a wave of uprisings nationwide. In the meantime, Liu Bang, as a minor official at Su Shui Pavilion, occupied Peixian County with his own men. When Liu Bang rose up against the Qin, many scholars went to him and tried to serve under him. But as far as Liu Bang was concerned, they were merely cowards in nice clothes. Moreover, he would even take scholars' hats and urinate into the hats just for the sake of humiliating the scholars. Little wonder so many scholars gave up on the idea of serving Liu Bang. During his days of fighting battles across the country, Liu Bang suffered a lot because of his lack of education. I learned the Liu Ying was the first son of Liu Bang and his empress, Liu Zhe. 
Not only was his writing bad, but he also asked people to write the official documents for him, which displeased Liu Bang greatly. When the war was finally over and his desk was filled with reports on complicated affairs of state, Liu Bang discovered that experience alone was not enough when it came to governing a huge empire. Persuaded by scholars such as Lu Jia, Liu Bang realized the importance of education in governing the country, so he issued many rules and regulations regarding writing. The laws of Han Dynasty specified in detail the standards of official document writing. When officials or people submitted a written report, they should be criticized if the writing was not standardized. The imperial court even established the earliest writing examination in China, influenced by the policies of Liu Bang. Ever since, Han people have attached great importance to the standardization of writing. Certainly, it was well-reasoned for Liu Ying, the eldest son of Liu Bang's legal wife, to succeed to the throne. But Liu Bang kept vacillating between Liu Ying and Liu Ru Yi, the son of consort Qi. But his idea of appointing the latter to be his heir was strongly opposed by the whole court. Liu Bang was thus caught in a dilemma. That remained the case until he saw the so-called Four Whiteheads of Mount Shang. The Four Whiteheads of Mount Shang refer to the four scholars known at the end of Qin and the beginning of Han. None of them were willing to serve in the court, so they all lived in seclusion on Mount Shang. Liu Bang had first heard of them very long before, even inviting them to serve in the court. But thanks to Liu Bang's history of humiliating scholars, none of these scholars accepted his invitation. According to the records of the Grand Historian, Liu Ying was accompanied to a banquet by the four whiteheads of Mount Chang, who, already in their 80s, took their seat beside him. Liu Bang was very surprised that the prince could rally them at court, so he gave up the idea of appointing Liu Ru Yi his heir. Because During the Chu Han contention, Liu Bang suffered repeated defeats, but kept up the fight despite the setbacks. In fact, most of the time, Liu Bang was no match for his rival Xiang Yu, whether in political or military power. Liu Bang couldn't write well or fight cleverly, but he managed to complete the counterattack against Xiang Yu at last. It was like a miracle. But Liu Bang, as an insider, was very clear about the reason. When According to records of the Grand Historian, after putting an end to the war, Liu Bang prepared a feast in Luoyang, attributing his accession to the throne to his use of the three talents, Zhang Liang, Xiao He, and Han Xin. Although Liu Bang had little education himself, he was surrounded by a galaxy of talents. The nobles, such as Zhang Liang, low officials, such as Xiao Hua, and scholars, such as Chen Ping, were the actual foundation of Liu Bang's achievements.
并缠身，大限将至。现在，我正式确定，你为皇位继承人。In June 195 BC, Liu Bang passed away, with Liu Ying succeeding to the throne, who would go down in history as Emperor Hui of Han. During his reign, he highly respected scholars and executed Liu Bang's will faithfully. He appointed Tao Tan, Grand Chancellor, after Xiao He's death, and Tao Tan continued Xiao's fundamental policy. This was where the saying derived, Chao followed the rules set by his predecessor, Xiao. In addition, Liu Ying listened to the suggestions of the four whiteheads of Mount Shang and implemented a national policy of rehabilitation, advocating peace and the governance by non-interference. So it was that the Han Empire prospered. Since Liu Bang, yearning for knowledge and respect for talents had become the motto of the Liu royal family. The Han Dynasty continued for more than 400 years, passing on the remarkable spirit of Han to future generations. China, therefore, became the most powerful country in the world. Ever since the Han Dynasty, studying has been one of the most important elements in Chinese family tradition. In 41 AD, famous general Ma Yuan, age 56, was on his long march to Jiaozhu. Upon hearing that his nephews, the Ma Yan and Ma Duan brothers, had been engaging in gossiping, he immediately sent them a letter. It is said that Ma Yuan's ancestor was Zhao Shu, a famous general in the Warring States period. Ma Yuan assisted Liu Xiu, the founding emperor of the Eastern Han Dynasty, in achieving the unity of the whole country. When the Eastern Han was founded, Ma Yuan was already 40 years old but he still volunteered to lead conquests across the country to put down rebellions. Classic Chinese idioms, such as gaining vigor with age and wrapping one's body with horse leather were invented by Ma Yuan. But such a bold and heroic man was extremely meticulous when it came to the education of children in his family. He repeatedly advised the children in the family to be humble and modest and to speak and act with discretion. 喜好议论别人的长短，胡乱评判国家的法度，这些都是我深恶痛绝的。我宁可死，也不希望自己的子孙有这种言行。Ma Yuan and Ma Dun were the children of Ma Yuan's elder brother, and their parents died when they were less than ten years old. Ma Yuan was concerned about them. So he brought them to his side. Born to a family of generals, the Ma brothers loved fencing and horseback archery in their youth, and they often met with swordsmen and gallant people, taking delight in criticizing others. Ma Yuan was deeply trusted by the emperor, and he was made the general who calms the waves, which was a title given to highly accomplished generals alone. It was just because of their uncle Ma Yuan that the Ma brothers were so unscrupulous. Long Bo Gao, this person is stern and honest. He said out words that no one can be angry with. He is gentle and kind, and he is worthy. I love him, I respect him, and I 
，希望你们好好向他学习。Ling Ling was in Eastern Han Prefecture. Nowadays, it's situated in Hunan Province. But at the beginning of the Eastern Han, the place was troubled by strife between various local powers, plunging the people who lived here into dire poverty. Ma Yuan came here to put down the insurgency, but the high mountains surrounding the area resulted in an insufficiency of military supplies. Long Bo Gao was Ma Yuan's colleague. He served as the chief of Lingling Prefecture, and right at the time, he lent assistance to Ma Yuan by selling his family property to support Ma Yuan's troops. But as an upright official, there was little of value he could sell. He even sold his wife's hairpin. Ma Yuan was very grateful for his assistance, ever after regarding Long as his bosom friend. Du Jiliang, this guy is a good guy, very honorable, good people, good people, good people. No matter who is good or bad, he is all together. When his father died, many people came to see him. 我爱他，敬重他，但不希望你们向他学习。Du Jiliang was another colleague of Ma Yuan. Obviously, Ma Yuan's educational approach was both vivid and simple. He thought that by comparing his two friends in real life, his nephews would be able to understand his intentions. Du Jiliang was generous and straightforward. He was a man who enjoyed making friends, but he had also offended many people due to his carelessness and impertinency. Amazingly, this letter from Ma Yuan was somehow discovered by Du Jiliang's foes later on. They submitted reports to the emperor accusing Du Jiliang by citing Ma Yuan's family letter. Although this farce resulted in no clear conclusions, it caused a sensation at the time, and it became evident that Du Jiliang enjoyed a poor reputation. If you learn Long Bo Gao, you can become a wise man. That's the way to say, the owner of the owner of the owner of the owner. But if you don't do Du Jiliang, you will be able to do the owner. 正所谓，画虎不成反类犬。到现在，杜继良还不知道，刚到任的郡将恨他恨得咬牙切齿，郡上的人也都恨他。我为他感到寒心，所以不愿子孙们学他。After that, Ma Yan and Ma Dun listened to their uncle's exhortation, devoting themselves to the study of Confucian classics and making friends with humble and modest talents. Their changes were a pleasant surprise for their elders, so later Ma Yuan entrusted the family affairs to the two brothers. In 48 AD, Ma Yuan, at the age of 62, volunteered again to pacify the rebels in Lingnan. Although the emperor, Liu Xiu, was concerned about the condition of his health, Ma Yuan still put on the armor and mounted the war horse, finally convincing the emperor of his vigor. Liu Xiu acclaimed him the most vigorous old man and approved his proposal. But this time, Ma Yuan didn't return. Instead, he realized his wish to die on the battlefield. By setting himself up as an example, Ma Yuan established a reputation for modesty and uprightness for his family. His descendants were also much valued by the Han Dynasty royalty. Ma Yan became a famous official as well, one who enjoyed a well-deserved reputation for uprightness. During the Three Kingdoms period, whoever possessed Jingzhou could dominate the whole country. Jingzhou was the gateway to the state of Wu. 
If it was lost, Wu would be enthralled to the state of Shu in the west and the state of Wei to the north. In 218 AD, right at the critical moment of Wu's capture of Jingzhou, a disturbance unexpectedly occurred on the front line. The cause of the trouble was Sun Jiao, cousin of the king of Wu, Sun Quan. Yigotulashin. This was a letter Sun Quan wrote to his cousin, Sun Jiao. Tao Tao suffered a crushing defeat in the Battle of Red Cliffs, and a situation of tripartite confrontation developed between the three kingdoms, Wei, Shu, and Wu, from then onwards. But Tao Tao, as actual leader of the state of Wei, wasn't reconciled to the defeat so he attacked Wu multiple times. During the Three Kingdoms' fight for hegemony, the Sun royal clan remained the mainstay of the state of Wu. As Sun Jiao was gallant and resourceful in battle, he was a military talent highly valued by Sun Quan. But he had shortcomings, intolerance and narrow-mindedness. Furthermore, he didn't like generals from outside the royal clan, so many talented generals were unwilling to go along with him. Gan Ning and Lu Meng were two talented generals alienated by Sun's sense of exclusivity. Gan Ning was one of the 12 tiger generals of Wu. Sun Jiao had a lot of conflicts with the gallant and skilled Gan Ning over trifling matters. Some people tried to persuade Gan Ning to avoid possible conflicts with Sun Jiao, but Gan Ning ignored all the advice and persisted in his old ways. The relationship between the two deteriorated even further. According to Records of the Three Kingdoms, Sun Jiao offended Gan Ning with rude remarks during a feast. Gan Ning was furious, and he thought that they should be treated with equality, since they were both generals serving the state of Wu. The fact that Sun Jiao was Sun Chen's cousin didn't give Sun Jiao the right to lord it over him. Tao Tao has Zhang Liao, while I have Gan Ning. For Sun Chen, Gan Ning was a friend worth dying for. Sun Chen was familiar with all the faults in Gan Ning's character and he also knew Sun Jiao's drawbacks. Jujibinbinyoli,而又普素的人,只能够统治民众。爱护他人,并且宽厚包容的人,则可以得到民心。这两点你尚且不懂,又怎么能够在远方都统三军,解救危难呢? In the late Eastern Han Dynasty, plenty of warlords rose up to fight for hegemony. Tao Tao introduced the policy of promoting the talented with equal opportunities, and Liu Bei, ruler of the state of Shu, paid three visits to the thatched cottage for advisor Zhu Guilian. Of all the founders of the three kingdoms, only Sun Quan seemed to fall behind in talent cultivation. But in fact, he was not inferior to Tao Tao and Liu Bei in identifying and appointing talents. At the age of 18, he took over the family inheritance from his father and brother. 
During his reign, the state of Wu grew stronger and stronger. An important reason for this was Sun Quan's tolerant and open-minded attitude to promoting and appointing talents. When his brothers in the royal clan had conflicts with officials outside the clan, Sun Quan was always able to uphold justice and to remain tolerant and generous. Compromise not only makes conflict easier to resolve, it also wins people over. That was one reason why the officials and generals of Wu were willing to fight for the Sun royal clan without hesitation. After being lectured by his cousin, Sun Jiao became mindful of his willfulness, immediately submitting a report acknowledging his mistake and expressing his willingness to make friends with Gan Ning and let go of the past. The next year, the Wu army seized Jingzhou. In a key battle, Gan Ning and Sun Jiao were both in the reinforcements, making great contributions thanks to their tacit cooperation. Families were patriarchal in traditional Chinese society. The example set by the patriarch in a clan was extremely important. Thanks to his impartial style of governance, Sun Quan rectified the willfulness of the younger generation in the Sun clan, establishing a family tradition of impartiality and selflessness. Thus, the state of Wu became the regime that lasted the longest of all the three kingdoms that existed at the end of the Han dynasty. In 1557 AD, during Ming Dynasty Jiajing Emperor's reign, Japanese pirates invaded the coastal areas of Zhejiang, putting Shen Lian's hometown, Shaoxing, in great danger. But by this time, Shen Lian was exiled to a frontier region north of the Gobi Desert. At that time, the Ming government was faced with two big problems. From the outside, they were menaced by Japanese pirates, while inside, they had evil governors to contend with, Yan Song and his son. While officials were too afraid to raise their voices, Shen Lian was daring and strong-willed. In 1551 AD, Shen Lian, as a minor embroidered uniform guard, submitted a report to the emperor in which he sharply denounced Yan Song and listed 10 accusations against him. He accused Yan Song and his son of being treacherous court officials who endangered the realm and requested that the emperor have them executed. Not only did Jia Jing emperor ignore Shen Lian's words, however, he also accused Shen Lian of framing Yan Song and his son. After being punished by flogging, Shen Lian was banished from the court to the desolate north. Nimishaho Shen Lian had three sons, two of whom were still young children at the time, while only Shen Xiang, his firstborn, had come of age. Shen Lian hoped that his son could follow the example of Fan Zhongyan, to be the first to bear the world's hardship 
and to devote himself to the country and the people. According to the history of Ming, Shen Lian's writing was a vivid reflection of his personality, upright and full of integrity. When serving as the county magistrate of Li Yang, Shen Lian was noticed by Lu Bing, the commander of the embroidered uniform guard, and then promoted to a civilian post at the imperial court. But at that juncture in history, a personality that abhorred evil was unlikely to be a good fit in the imperial court at that time. During Jia Jing Emperor's reign, the embroidered uniform guard was the incarnation of darkness and terror. In their ranks, Shen Lian was an alien. The embroidered uniform guard was basically the imperial secret police of the Ming dynasty, mainly responsible for investigation, apprehension, and interrogation. Since Lu Bing was close to Yan Song and his son, Shen Lian was able to accompany him to the feasts at Yan's mansion many times. This is how he assembled evidences of their crimes. Chaotin Despite being banished to a desolate place, Shen Lian still attacked Yan Song and his faction ferociously. Yan Song, the treacherous Grand Chancellor, was known to the country for taking bribes. At that time, Yan Song always came top of the list when corrupt officials were impeached by the royal censors. Every time he was impeached, he would go to Jia Jing Emperor to show his loyalty and faith and somehow muddle through. It was a tactic that never failed. Shen Lian's repeated impeachments and admonitions made the Yan family hate him like poison. During his rustication, he still insisted on writing articles admonishing Yen Song. Naturally, Yen Song was infuriated and he asked his aides to frame up Shen Lian so as to get him executed. But Shen Lian had no regrets. He'd die a thousand times as long as he could live morally and righteously. But such a persistence could only lead to tragedy in an age when the talented were abandoned and the mediocre entrusted with high office. Shen Lian's fate was sealed. 眼下国家政府危难，你们却不能出一言献一策，只知道埋首只对勋章摘句，不正是自己肩上的责任？在如此危难之际，不去为国家、为人民排忧解难，那你们平日所学的知识又有何用？ In autumn that year, a trumped-up charge of being a member of the White Lotus Society was hurled at Shen Lian. He was decapitated. His two younger sons were killed by the Yan faction, while his eldest son, Shen Xiang, was banished from the court to garrison the frontier region. But Shen Lian's sacrifice was not in vain. His fight against the Yan family was a huge inspiration to the righteous men of that time, speeding up the family's downfall. At the cost of his life, Shen Lian established a reputation for his family of righteousness and the unyielding spirit. Following his father's admonitions, Shen Xiang devoted himself to the welfare of the people. History records that when Shen Xiang served as an official, there were no delayed cases 
and that he focused his efforts on charity and the construction of dams. Shen Lian could rest in peace, content that he did his best to help the people of his country. Ten forty three AD was a special year for Fan Zhong Yen. At the imperial court, Emperor Ren Zong of the Song Dynasty appointed him Grand Vice Chancellor to implement political reforms. These have gone down in history as the Qing Li reforms. At home, Da Tan, the nephew Fan placed high hopes on, was ready to become an official at court. Da Tan. 你任之后，要一心勤学奉公，无需担忧前途，万不可写信求人提拔。只有充实自己，才是最好。During the Song Dynasty. High-ranking officials could recommend their own clan members to be low-ranking officials at court. It was called the Inbu system, but it was a state of affairs that discouraged the children of officials from making their own way in life. Why bother when they would get a court position via the system? Fan Zhongyan received a great number of letters from the Fan clan asking for an official post at court, but he turned down all of them. During the Qing Li reforms, Fan Zhongyan presented a ten-point proposal on rectifying the bureaucracy, and one of them concerned the Inbu system. He raised the threshold of the system and specified that all presentees could only be appointed to a post after an examination. Fan himself set up an example for the officials. His nephew Da Tan had achieved his official position by taking an examination. Throughout Chinese history, Fan Zhongyan was worthy of the title "a perfect man." He was self-disciplined and confident, selfless and fearless, impartial and unprejudiced. After his death, Emperor Ren Zhong conferred on him the posthumous title Wen Zhong. Gaining such a posthumous title had been the aspiration of scholars for over a thousand years. Fan Zhongyan was the only person honored in this way in the Song Dynasty. Da Tan, 早些年家里还贫困的时候，和你母亲一同赡养祖母。你母亲做饭，我尝咸淡，生活一直很艰难。如今。有了丰厚的俸禄，想要好好补偿他们，他们却已不在人世。让我感到遗憾的是，你们现在都过着富足的生活，从未有过我年少时的经历。Fan Zhongyan firmly believed that the sufferings one experienced in youth would help shape a noble character. Before Fan reached the age of 22, he was named Zhu Wei. His father passed away early, so his mother had to marry into the Zhu family in Shandong. Fan discovered the truth of his origins thanks to taunts and teases of the Zhu brothers. At that time, studying was the only way out if a person wanted to become independent. Fan decided to change his life. According to the history of Song, when Fan Zhongyan was studying in a Buddhist monastery, he would simmer a pot of millet for a whole night. When the congee coagulated, he would slice it into four pieces, having two pieces in the morning and the other two in the evening. This was how he filled his belly. If he felt sleepy while reading at night. 
he would refresh himself by washing his face with cold water. Such self-discipline characterized him for the rest of his life. At the age of 26, Fan passed the highest level of imperial examination, and for the next dozen years or so, he served as a minor local official. Born into a poor family himself, Fan felt a strong sense of empathy with ordinary people, going to extraordinary lengths to help them. In Taizhou, when he noticed the seawall out of repair and people losing their homes, he submitted a report to the imperial court, suggesting the construction of a seawall along the coast from today's Lian Yungang to the Yangtze River estuary. People referred to this as Duke Fan's embankment. In Fan Zhong Yan's era, the Northern Song Dynasty was challenged by both domestic turmoil and foreign aggression. With a large number of bureaucrats, the expenses in armament and bureaucrats accounted for a large proportion of the government's revenue. People became increasingly poor, and the country fell into impoverishment and long-term decline. In 1036 AD, Fan Zhong Yin presented to Emperor Renzong a chart listing all officials. This basically amounted to an investigative report on in-service officials. He listed the promotion methods adopted by all officials and analyzed their approach to administration, singling out Grand Chancellor Lu Yijian for his backdoor dealing and cronyism. But Lu was scheming and calculating, hitting back by making false accusations against Fan and having him rusticated to Raozhou Jiangxi. On Fan's way to Raozhou, no one dared to receive him. Not that Fan cared. He wrote a poem. Why should I care about the mundane honor and disgrace? The old man at the border has his self-awareness. During that difficult time, Fan Zhong Yen's wife passed away, and he himself became seriously ill. His friend wrote a letter to him, trying to persuade him to stop being so sharp and stubborn, and to stop reporting only bad news. If he didn't change his way, he was bound to get himself killed eventually. But Fan's reply to him was, he'd rather die with a voice than live his life in silence. In 1043 AD, Emperor Renzong gave 54-year-old Fan Zhong Yen an important role in implementing the Qingli reforms. But a year into the Qingli reforms, they were rescinded because of obstructions and false charges. Fan Zhong Yen was soon on the move again, destined for a position outside the capital. Two years later, he composed Memorial to Yue Yang Tower, in which he expressed his mixed feelings. The line, be the first to bear the world's hardship and the last to enjoy its comfort, is especially poignant as it encapsulated a long-cherished ideal he failed to realize. He donated his life savings to the purchase of about 70 hectares of fertile farmland in Suzhou and established Fan's charitable organization. He also set up charity farms and schools, offering relief to clansmen and villagers and offering their children education. Fan's philanthropic acts blazed a trail in the history of charitable causes. According to Wuxian County Annals, by the end of the Qing Dynasty, there were in total 62 charitable organizations in Suzhou with charitable farmlands of over 4,500 hectares. By 1949, there were still 23 charitable organizations in Suzhou. 
，没挽救琴前，我要合计一天的俸禄和所做的事。如果二者相当，就能安枕入眠。如果不是这样，内心就不安，闭目也睡不着。第二天一定要做事补回来，让所作所为对得起俸禄。如今，我之所以打算退休，是因我年老体衰，精力有限，能为他人做的事。一天比一天少，对不住百姓，也对不住俸禄啊。As he had disposed of all his assets, Fan Zhongyan, in later years, stayed in a house provided by local officials together with his family. In 1052 A.D., Fan passed away at the age of 63. The whole country mourned his death when they heard the news of his passing. Despite the ups and downs in Fan's life, his concern for the country was always paramount. Ever ready to speak out on behalf of the people he loved so dearly, he was content to sacrifice his own happiness for that of the whole country. Inspired by Fan Zhongyan, many Fan family members passed the imperial examination. Fan Chunren, his second son, assisted five emperors in his life, going down in history as the great commoner chancellor. Despite achieving a higher position than his father, he retained the best features of the senior Fan's character. The mountains in clouds are vast, and the river is magnificent. The nobility of your character is as high as the mountains and as long as the river. These are the lines Fan Zhong Yin wrote in praise of Yin Guang, a literatus of the Han Dynasty, but they could equally apply to Fan himself. Family tradition is the backbone of a family. If a family adheres to integrity, it may become one of the pillars that support the whole nation. The talents who devoted themselves to the service of the public in historical times became the cornerstones of the Chinese ethos. Their spirits exercising an influence that continues to be felt to this very day. <laughs>